Falcon and the Winter Soldier premieres this month exclusively on Disney+. Plus. By this time, I'm sure everyone knows that Winter Soldier was Captain America's sidekick and best bud, Bucky Barnes. Who's Bucky? But I'd wager that there are less people that realize that after World War II, Bucky Barnes just wasn't around too much. At least in the quote-unquote modern day of the Marvel comic book universe, because he was presumed dead. But in reality, he was just one of the many disappeared sidekicks from the early days of Marvel, when it was timely. Gone the way of Toro, the Human Torch's sidekick. Not that Human Torch, this Human Torch, who was an android, and later his body was used to create the Vision. Yes, that Vision. That's just the way the cookie crumbled until, in 2005, Ed Brubaker glued that cookie back together and broke it in a completely different way. That's right, the Winter Soldier has only been around since the 2005 Captain America series, which revealed that Bucky did survive World War II, was captured by the Russians, given a bionic arm, and turned into an assassin for the Soviet Union. But that's a story for another time. I'm talking about Fighting American, not Winter Soldier. Before I get into this episode, let me get some plugs in out of the way before we start. I have a 40-page comic anthology made up of three short stories that is out now. It's called Destructo Boy and Other Exciting Tales. It's part of a limited print run, so make sure you get your copy while it's hot. Who is Fighting American? Well, you may be most familiar with Fighting American from the awesome entertainment comic book series by Rob Liefeld and Jeff Loeb. He sure looks like a Liefeld ripping off Captain America to make his own indie comic book. Fighting American actually premiered in 1954, written, and occasionally drawn, by Joe Simon, with art by Jack Kirby. That's right, Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, creators of Captain America, among many others, made a creator-owned comic in the 1950s. Unlike Cap, however, Fighting American had no Nazis to battle, but he had plenty of communists and red sympathizers. The whole better dead than red aspect only lasted about an issue, and then after the McCarthy hearings and the public at large realized that McCarthy is a maniac, Joe and Jack switched it over to a kooky superhero satire full of crazy characters. And it's amazing. But who is Fighting American? The original Fighting American series follows former star athlete and war hero Johnny Flagg, an outspoken anti-communist spokesman and TV commentator at Station USA, and his younger brother, Nelson Flagg, who works as his writer. Unfortunately, however, Johnny was wounded in the war, so he's unable to stop the commies in a hands-on manner, almost like a certain other star-spangled hero who was too weak to fight the Nazis. I think you see where this is going. In the first issue, Johnny is shot to death by communist sympathizers, and on his deathbed, his meek brother Nelson promises to avenge him. The U.S. military promptly recruits Nelson, and then transfers his mind and life force into his dead brother's revitalized and strengthened corpse. Nelson then takes Johnny's identity and becomes... Fighting American. Eventually, after some commies attack the news station, Johnny Flagg's secret identity is found out by a spunky teenage intern who then becomes Fighting American sidekick Speed Boy. We never learn his real name. Uh, he's always referred to as Speed Boy. The original 50s series is absolutely amazing, and I plan on covering it sometime in the future because I just love it so much. And come on, it's a creator-owned comic by Jack Kirby and Joe Simon from the 50s. That was not the norm. Anyway, fast forward to the 1990s. DC Comics licensed the character for a six-issue series in 1994. I haven't read that one, but from the few glimpses I've seen of it, it sort of seems like it takes itself way too seriously. But then, in 1997, Rob Liefeld got his hands on the license for Fighting American and created a two-issue miniseries by himself, Jeff Loeb, and Stephen Platt. If you want to know more about how Rob Liefeld got his hands on Fighting American, I strongly recommend listening to his podcast, Rob Servations. He dedicated an entire episode to Fighting American. In the, like, sort of soft reboot by Awesome Comics, John Flagg is retired and continually laments the death of his partner and is living on a farm until he's brought back into the field to take up his mantle as Fighting American and is teamed up with a new sidekick, a cybernetic slash maybe android girl called Spice. In a follow-up series released in early 1998 called Fighting American Rules of the Game, 
John Flagg and Spice continue their adventures against some original fighting American enemies like Poison Ivan and Hotsky Trotsky. This miniseries ran for three issues, and then, in later 1998, Rob Liefeld got Jim Starlin, that's right, the creator of Thanos, among many other Marvel characters, to write a fighting American series. At least five issues. And that is what I'll be talking about. Released in 1998... Written by Jim Starlin, with art by the amazing Stephen Platt. This is Fighting American, Dogs of War. Also, fun fact about Fighting American, while he does have a round shield like a certain other patriotic hero, Awesome Entertainment was legally prohibited from having him throw it. You'll see their workarounds. The book begins somewhere along the Mekong River in Cambodia. I can only guess that this prologue is taking place in the past, during the Cambodian-Vietnamese War. Uh, it never gets brought up again, so whatever. A mysterious figure emerges out of the river and makes his way past the strewn dead bodies and into the camp of the Khmer Rouge. He's in the country to retrieve a CIA agent who was bagged and is now a prisoner of war. The figure makes his way quietly into the camp and witnesses soldiers torturing the CIA agent that he was sent here to rescue. The CIA agent begs his captors to release him and that he'll tell them anything they want to know, and the main bad guy is like, you have nothing of importance to us, we're just sort of doing this because we're bored. Then the mysterious shadowy figure's monologue says, I recognize these men. Cold and hard. Just like me. So I'm not surprised when they decide to play another game. CIA agent Duffy is then forced to play Russian roulette as the mystery man races to stop it. But for all those leg muscles and giant quads, he still isn't fast enough. The man stands in the doorway looking over the dead body of the agent, and the leader of the camp says, You have been cheated of your prize. Mr. Fighting American. Don't ever call me that. Jesus, do, do, do these handguns fire 50 caliber? I don't know. Are they like Desert Eagles or something? I don't know. Because these are 90s guns. Guns which simultaneously look like guns and little spaceships. Cut to Washington, D.C. Fighting American flies in a helicopter to a warehouse in Baltimore on a mission. Cut to Baltimore. Fighting American skydives out of the helicopter like a badass and crashes through the roof of this warehouse like a dope. Look at his face. That is not the expression of someone who expected to crash through the ceiling. His calves alone must weigh 100 pounds. Anyway, there's this deal going on between Russians and Iranians and like a few mercs thrown in for good measure. Then for whatever reason, the narration switches to this ex-Soviet general guy who is leading the deal. Uh, he ducks away and watches Fighting American beat everyone's shit in. Then he walks over to this fancy little Soviet-themed briefcase and brings out a high-tech future gun. As Fighting American fights a never-ending army of blonde men in trench coats and this one guy with a blue mohawk ponytail combo in a trench coat, other blonde men in trench coats open fire on him. So Fighting American uses the built-in machine gun inside of his shield and guns everyone down. The smoke clears and Fighting American stands in a sea of corpses, which is something that'll really fuck up your psyche. John wonders how many of these men he just killed had families waiting for them. How many of these men needed a job and just took this one. As he does so, someone sneaks up behind him with a handgun. Fighting American superhero and alerts him, and he quickly dodges the three bullets. The shooter is revealed to be this woman. She reveals to Captain... Fuck, <laughs> I knew that was gonna happen. She reveals to Fighting American that she's his contact and tells him to turn around, which reveals that she was actually shooting at, like, one of the surviving mercs who was about to shoot Fighting American. The two then walk over to the briefcase, but discover that it... <gasps> Shock, it's empty. Then, from across the room, the Soviet general aims his future gun, acquires a DNA target, and opens fire. The rocket flies through the warehouse, and Fighting American's senses again alert him to the danger, so he's able to leap out of the way, saving himself and his contact. But the rocket loops back around and chases after the two as it zeroes in on its target's DNA. Fighting American crashes out of a window, and they plummet to the ground as the rocket gives chase. They land and are then separated. Fighting American takes up a defensive stance and prepares to take the force of the rocket with his shield, when the rocket takes two 90-degree turns, zooms around him, and blows up his contact. Whoopsies. 
guess she must have just walked in front of the general's line of sight when he was getting the DNA matrix, whatever the fuck. So the general tries it again, and another rocket fires towards Fighting American when it's blown out of the sky. The explosion still sends John flying away, but once he stands up, he sees a figure emerging from the dust and smoke. A man known only as No Name. <laughs> Cut to Nigeria for some reason. Fighting American and No Name are on a mission to find, rescue, and interrogate an arms dealer. The two bust inside and be badasses, and Fighting American snatches up the arms dealer as No Name tells him to get going to their meeting point. He'll, he'll catch up and take care of the warehouse. A lot of this story takes place in or around warehouses. So, No Name plants a plastic explosive inside and the two escape as the building blows sky high. Later at a safe house, the two interrogate the arms dealer, who won't give them any information. So, No Name shoots him in the knee, causing the merchant to give them everything they want to know. The Soviet general? His name is actually Alexander Zarkov, and he's really a colonel. Zarkov was head of security at an experimental weapons depot, but when the USSR collapsed, he became a freelancer and started selling weapons, and what the fuck, did you really have to draw his puddle of piss? Or maybe that was supposed to be blood and the colorist just thought it was a puddle of piss. I don't know, it's still weird. Anyway, the guy tells them about this project called Zero Tolerance, but he doesn't know anything about it other than the name. Then the US, then the US military shows up and takes him away. Fighting American tells No Name to hang back for a second and says, When I have someone in custody, no one puts a bullet into them. No one. You understand me? Yeah, a lot better than you think. That's right! No Name, the mysterious government wetworks agent, is actually the adult speed boy. This is the original Winter Soldier. Fighting American Dogs of War came out in 1998. Winter Soldier was revealed in 2005. I mean, yeah, No Name as a title fucking sucks, but come on! Jim Starlin created the Winter Soldier before Ed Brubaker did. Elsewhere, cybernetic dumbass Zarkov has somehow tracked down Fighting American and prepares to fire his dumb future DNA rocket when an enemy agent opens fire on him. So Zarkov uses his fancy jetpack and flies away. Later, Fighting American and No Name investigate and find a... Shuriken? Cut to a secret chamber beneath the Pentagon. No Name and Fighting American finish reporting what they discovered in Nigeria, and the hot-headed, power-hungry generals demand that they discover what Zero Tolerance is and get a hold of it. Then they inform them that they'll be leaving for Zarkov's castle in Albania in one hour. Cut to Albania. Fighting American and No Name parachute down to the castle of Zarkov. They quickly and silently infiltrate, make their way to the basement, where they find a massive cache of weapons. As No Name fawns over the weapons, Fighting American alerts him that they have company. The two then duck behind some crates as a platoon of soldiers run past. They follow where they went and discover the guards are fighting the Scarlet Dragon. Red China's answer to fighting American. Look, he has his own shield. Fighting American deduces that the shuriken, sorry, Shuriken in Nigeria was from Scarlet Dragon. No Name asks if he's really gonna do this, and Fighting American races off to help Scarlet Dragon. No Name lights a cigarette before jumping into the fray, and we get this crazy double page spread, so you have to turn the book like you're looking at a centerfold, when in reality it's just Stephen Platt's trademark bullet casings getting all over the pages. Fighting American realizes that getting caught in a firefight in the safe house of their enemy isn't exactly the best idea, and they shouldn't stick around much longer, so he uses his shield's laser beam function and kills most of the guards. He stands aside trying to come to terms with the fact that he just lasered a bunch of guys to death as Scarlet Dragon and No Name clean up the remnants. No Name tells Fighting American that Scarlet Dragon took off at the end of the fight and calls him a chink. What the fuck, Speed Boy? Jesus Christ. Then they return to the castle and find this weird panel that makes it look like they're floating in a black void. They enter the room and discover a multitude of computational devices. No Name searches the computer as Fighting American looks in the dozens of filing cabinets. Once No Name gets the zero tolerance files that are on the computer, he just emails them to the Pentagon? I didn't realize it was that easy. No Name then asks Fighting American how his search is coming, and John holds out on his partner and just says that all he's found are spreadsheets and personnel files. In reality, he came across a disk with very important information on zero tolerance. Then No Name said, What the fuck is- what is that? Is that a smudge on the paper? I, I can't read what that's supposed to be. Is it? Oh, I, I guess it's. I guess it's supposed to be the telephone ringing. 
No Name answers it, and on the other side is the Scarlet Dragon, alerting them that there's a bomb in the castle, the very same room they're standing inside, in fact, and they should probably leave. The two escape, and six hours later, they're back in the secret chamber beneath the Pentagon. No Name recaps what happened, and then another agent informs them about what they uncovered from the files that No Name sent about Zero Tolerance. If you're not already, you want to sit down for this. Zero Tolerance, you see, is a weapon that can be targeted to a set range of melon. That's right. This is literally a racist bomb. And thanks to a quick time movie they found in the data, they've discovered that the zero tolerance weapon sends out a microwave that affects a targeted range of people with certain skin hues, which boils them alive and forms tumors in their bodies for up to 15 minutes until they die. The agent informs them that it can be broadcast over a thousand square mile radius, meaning that, for example, any one of the ethnic groups in New York State could be wiped out in 15 minutes. Fighting American says that Zarkov will be stopped, and then he's instructed to retrieve zero tolerance if at all possible, or if not, get enough information as to allow the US to make their own. After being dismissed, Fighting American stands on the roof of the Pentagon and watches the sun rise. He brings out the disc he took from the castle, the disc containing schematics and specifications on zero tolerance. And he questions on wh what the fuck he's gonna do with it, because he sure as shit isn't giving it to his superiors. Fighting American then hears a voice calling to him, so he turns around and sees Speed Boy, who has yet again changed his hair color for some reason. Come on, colorist, you really can't keep it simple. He's fucking blonde. He blinks and then sees no name walking towards him. John pockets the disc and the two talk about how small the people on the ground look from up here. John says they seem so vulnerable, in need of protection, while no name says that all he sees are slobs who don't appreciate what he's done for them. Cut to Peru. Zarkov meets with a Texas oil baron who looks like Sam Elliott about selling zero tolerance so that this man can make Texas the way God meant it to be. All white. As this meeting is taking place, Fighting American and No Name trek through the jungle towards the Soviet compound, and Scarlet Dragon appears, and they fight for some reason, and a security camera spots them, so Zarkov orders his auto guards to take care of them. The auto guards are these crazy looking insectoid humanoid robots with human brains inside of them, kind of like that giant cyborg from Spawn Batman. They fight the auto guards, but they quickly discover that. They have self-repairing systems, somehow. Uh, they fight some more, No Name gets wounded, and Fighting American cries out to him, calling him Speed Boy. Then he uses his built-in rocket launcher in his shield and blows up two of the drones. Scarlet Dragon fights the final one and sends it careening down towards Fighting American, who destroys it. In the aftermath, Scarlet Dragon and Fighting American form a temporary alliance after checking on No Name. The two then look over the valley to the now-burning compound, as a helicopter flies away. With the stinger, next, the strange alliance. Except there never was a next. This is how Fighting American Dogs of War ends on this stupid cliffhanger because it was never picked back up and the, I guess, I think there's supposed to be two more issues maybe were never made. Why did no more issues ever come out? Well, J.R. Lamar at iBlogalot.com suspects that it was probably due to a falling out that Rob Liefeld had with Stephen Platt in 1998-99. And this was in part due to Platt's immense delays in their titles and his maximalism art style not exactly being the best for a monthly title. If you ever read Profit, there's a little bit at the end of one of the issues where it says that due to the tardiness of the artist, Profit number seven will be delayed. So yeah, things were starting to cook a little bit to a boil between the two of them. Until, you know, they just stopped working together. And Fighting American never got a new artist, so who knows how it was supposed to end. Maybe Speed Boy wasn't No Name, and it was just a fake out. I hope not, because that would be really dumb. But we'll never know! So for now, this is the original Winter Soldier. If I ever meet Jim Starlin, I'll make sure to ask him how the series was supposed to end as I get him to sign issue one of Dogs of War, of which I own two. So, uh, yeah, the end.
I hope you enjoyed this episode of What Is, and I hope you found it interesting that this... And I hope you found it interesting learning about this weirdly winter soldier before winter soldier. Let me know what you thought of the story in the comments below, and as always, leave any recommendations down there as well. I can't wait for Falcon and Winter Soldier and this new era of Marvel television. My favorite part of the MCU and Disney Plus is that this means that the Marvel Cinematic Universe is going to become progressively more and more bogged down in continuity, just like the regular Marvel Universe and the Ultimate Universe, which was explicitly made to not be bogged down in continuity. Again, my 40-page comic Destructo Boy and Other Exciting Tales is on sale now for $19.99. Check out the link in the description. Follow me on Instagram at Smokies Videos and at NotBlakeWild for updates on my 166-page graphic novel set in the Old West. I'll see you next time. Bye!